Some of us use Uber or Lyft, taxis, buses, trains, and subways, or even ride motorcycles or bicycles. Many of us get into our cars to go somewhere without a thought. But what if that was also our home, temporarily, or felt as if it were our home for the foreseeable future? Not knowing where we would land while in transition because we lost a job or had huge medical bills or a catastrophic incident that took away our ability to pay our rent or mortgage. What if we had to take our most treasured personal items or our pets with us wherever we went? Most of us never have to consider our car as our home, but some of us do. And as the featured organization will soon share, nobody plans to be homeless. Welcome to Small and Gutsy, a podcast featuring interviews with nonprofit and social impact organizations under $10 million. My name is Laura Whitkoff, and I'm excited and proud to be your host. My hope is that you love the stories as much as we do, and perhaps you will find needed services, a job, volunteer, invest in, or donate. Feel free to pass along any valuable information you hear today to others, and remember to send me the name of any organization you'd like featured at Reach Us at the Intrinsic Group. Com. Founded in 2016, Safe Parking LA is a coordinating organization for the community which assists homeless families and individuals living in their vehicles. They support the implementation of safe parking lots by providing individuals a safe place to park each night, restroom access, a security guard, and social service resources. Safe parking programs are a safe and legal homelessness intervention offering stabilization and connections to resources for people currently living in their vehicles. Safe Parking LA was modeled after the New Beginning Santa Barbara Safe Parking Program that has been in operation since 2004. Although the Santa Barbara program was a great model and successful, it wasn't until March of 2018 that Safe Parking LA opened its first safe parking lot in Koreatown in Los Angeles. A second safe parking lot location for veterans was opened in April of 2018 at the Department of Veteran Affairs campus in West Los Angeles. And in 2021, a total of eight sites will have opened with locations in Hollywood, North Hollywood, Reseda, Echo Park, and additional West LA sites. These eight sites provide safety for up to 190 vehicles and approximately 220 persons every night. I am so excited to introduce my guest today, Sylvia Gutierrez, Executive Director, Sydney Armstrong, case manager for the Iowa location, and Area Baltazar, case manager for the Convention Center. So let's get started. Welcome, Sylvia, Area, Sydney. Please share your passion about Safe Parking LA, your deep commitment to this population in this service area, and what led you to join Safe Parking LA. And I don't know, Sylvia, do you want to start? Yeah, thank right. you. Thank you, Laura for giving us the opportunity to talk about safe parking and to just try to educate and, and inform people about what's going on. And, and actually, when we talk about safe parking, it's one, it's the newest strategy that's been adopted in LA County as a support system for people that are experiencing homelessness. And even though it's the newest strategy, mm -hmm. people have been living in their cars since the beginning of time, I'm sure. Because as long as I've been working in the social services sector, which is over 20 years, people have been living in their vehicles. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense. It makes sense to me because when you lose everything, what you have, if you're lucky, if you're fortunate, is you have a vehicle. And that's where we gravitate as human beings to stay mm -hmm. where we know and hang on to the last thing that we might have. Yeah. Um, so I actually am new to safe parking myself. I started as the executive director in May of 2020 during the pandemic. So that was pretty exciting. Uh, yeah, I think sure. all of us all of us are new to Safe Parking LA, and, and we are uh, pioneers in, in starting new jobs during a pandemic mm -hmm. and figuring out how to learn something new, work safely, and, and be efficient and supportive to our clients. Safe Parking LA was founded by three passionate people, Scott Sale, Pat, and Ira Cohen, who really wanted to make a difference. And they were really, really intelligent and smart people because they also looked around and saw all of these parking spaces that were empty in the evening. Mm -hmm. So our program model is to utilize parking structures that already exist and have other daytime uses 
and implement our programs in the evenings. So that, you know, we don't need to create anything. We just need uh, security so that our clients are safe. We need sanitation so that our clients have access to restrooms. And then we need a case manager so that our clients are able to start, you know, the work of looking at what are their next steps? You know, mm -hmm. what are their strengths? What are the resources that they need? And we really, this year, brought on that piece of design to our programs. Mm -hmm. We really implemented case management. We have um, eight parking programs and all of our Lots have case managers that are really focused on our clients and focused on developing housing and stability plans. Okay. So safe parking's really changed since I've been here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we've added a great group of, of team members that have a great passion for our clients and a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. And they understand that people that are living in their cars are experiencing crisis. And we work really hard to pivot them into safe housing as quickly as possible so that they don't need to park in our parking programs. Mm -hmm. So I'm really happy that Aurea and Sydney agreed to be part of this. They're really awesome case managers. They have a lot of experience and they are the ones interfacing and creating community with our clients. Thank you, Sylvia, and welcome. I am thrilled that it sounds like the three of you have joined sort of during COVID, and I definitely want to hear about that when I, I want to hand it over to Area and Sydney in terms of their experience, but I just want to comment on something. Living in your car has been around for a long time, but yeah. living in your car safely is a relatively new phenomenon, and I really, really love what you do because you're you're using existing collateral that's out there and just saying, hey, Folks deserve to be safe exactly. and while they're in transition. And it's just a beautiful mechanism that LA can utilize even more so, I imagine, during COVID. But I want to hand it over to Area and Sydney and just jump in with your experience and your connection to safe parking and what you've observed and your passion. Also pretty brand new to safe parking, trying to compare what safe parking was prior to it is hard for me, but what I've seen so far is that we've adapted really quickly. For example, right, we are doing technology based. Our applications are online. We also do phone calls. Some of our clients don't have access to that, or maybe they're not tech savvy. There was an officer who called and said, hi, I have someone in our station right now who don't have access uh, to a cell phone to um, the internet and even with libraries, right? A lot of, I would see a lot of unhealthy books in libraries being held there. I'm glad that we do in-person appointments so that we can cater to their needs. I feel like this is a good job with doing the needs of our clients. And that just goes to show like, I, I'm so passionate for safe community and working with unhealthy folks. For me, everyone deserves to be held. Correcting me, anyone from, from what I read last time, I believe at least in LA or California, there's enough vacant homes for everyone to have too. Yeah, it's not that there's no places to live. Once again, also our clients aren't aware of these resources. I myself, I'm a system detective child, and I know that it's so hard to navigate these systems. For me, when I can align with the organization itself, I just feel like I do my, my job way better because I have my supervisors, they have my back and they have my clients back. What a beautiful uh, frame that you created because it's your, the, it's a, a passion that comes from a personal place because your values and your ethics are aligned with the organizations. And I really appreciated what you said about there are folks who do not have technology access and nor can they navigate a complicated system. I think even for your average person who does, I struggle with trying to navigate the healthcare system as an example. So trying to figure out housing and trying to figure out where I can find a safe place to park to then meet safely face-to-face -to, -face to try to provide resources and support for the particular client. Uh, Sydney, jump in. I'm fairly new as well, but I've been working with social services for several years. Safe Park and True is a really unique design safe organization for the patients who truly get to the point to where they feel they have nothing left. They've lost a home, they've been categorized as homeless individuals. So we're able to create some really unique personal design plans to get them back on their feet, primarily designed to get them permanent housing, employment services, come back to feeling like they're you know, normal individuals. 
And it sounds as if the opportunity to help folks transition, however long that takes, yeah. is significant. And I'm curious, I have actually many questions, but one that comes to mind is, have you all seen a shift and in increase during COVID-19? Because we know the homeless numbers have just skyrocketed. And I can't imagine that you that hasn't impacted your organization. It impacted us differently. When I came on board in May, we actually were operating at a low capacity. With the COVID pandemic, people got afraid. Mm. And they left the yeah. parking programs, you know, because when you were living in your vehicle, I mean, no matter how safe we provide services by having a security guard, you're still living in the outside elements, yeah. you know, and COVID-19 was unknown territory. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you get it? What is safety? I yeah. think all of those things were just really paramount to the people that were parking and, and people made decisions to go indoors that they probably wouldn't have made mm -hmm. if we weren't in the middle of the pandemic. So a lot of the work that we've done since May and August when Aurea and Sydney joined us mm -hmm. is to do a lot of outreach and education about our programs mm -hmm. and, and that we're here and who we are and how we do intakes and, and really try to spread the word. Because the other thing that happened is that people stopped meeting. Mm -hmm. and and collaborations and and networks and and you know meetings stopped happening so we've had to pivot our work remotely it's not the yeah. same thing as as meeting with you know all of the providers you know in the west side or going to the va and seeing people face to face mm -hmm. and as we're trying to pivot so is everyone else yeah. and so we're sometimes it feels like we're scrambling trying to make this thing work when i started none of the staff was working in the office anymore and we were not meeting with clients face-to-face, uh, -face, for example. So I transitioned everybody over in July to start doing half remote and one day in the office and one day in the parking lot, mm -hmm. you know, and, and just as we became more educated as a society about what, you know, being safe looks like mm -hmm. in a pandemic mm -hmm. and we became more educated ourselves, you know, we were able to, to start pivoting back to direct services. One of the best things that I love about our organization is how everyone is always open to finding a solution. It's not just me, it's everyone on our team. We're always mm -hmm. looking at considering how we can do something and not just saying we can't do that. I think everyone does that. And for example, we had protests that turned into riots, right, last year yeah. in L.A. County. You know, the mayor implemented the curfews mm -hmm. and everybody had to be indoors at five o'clock. Right. Our programs don't open until 730 or 830. Mm -hmm. So we literally had to contact every city and county official to open up our parking programs at five o'clock mm -hmm. so that everyone could come in safely. And, and that's kind of the work of it, because at the end of the day, we are operating in an outside element. And so our clients, our program, ourselves are subject to whatever could possibly happen right. in the outside elements. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that's different about the work that we do. I really appreciate both the um, energy that it takes to think creatively and the culture that you all have created is there's nothing that's insurmountable. You will mm -hmm. figure out another way to look at it in order to meet the need of the program slash the client. And that's what I think um, Area was talking about before about flexibility and Sydney mentioned it too. It's really, I think that is such a cultural thing. I think anyone you hire that has to be one of your questions, like, do you fit our culture? You gotta be thinking right creatively. Because I do think that, especially in a pandemic, you get confronted with something that becomes a city ordinance or a county ordinance. And then you have to go, okay, wait a second, that impacts our clients and the way we operate. We got to figure out how to do a workaround that's safe and respectful, but helps our clients. My guess is that there are a lot of myths about your population. And I'd love for you to address that because I think, I, I know from 
some personal experience, which I'll share a little bit later, but I just want you to speak to some of the myths that people have, the misconceptions, and let's do some re-education while I, while I have the three of you. We had a similar conversation about this yesterday. The misconceptions that I shared, that I had, was that everybody was low income. At the receipt of law, I made a client five grand a month. I was shocked, and I was like, oh, like, what's happened to you? The barrier was her credit report. Anytime she applied for housing, it just would not let her move to the next step. It also helped me understanding the biases that I have, how to uh, reach the, the way I work with folks, and not to come with any assumptions. All, our clients vary uh, so much. Their goals, whether it's employment, housing, clients who want to buy a house, they don't want to transition to an apartment or a one bedroom or two housing. They want to buy their home. And we're like, okay, you know, and we support our clients in whatever they need. It's such a great example that you bring up because our system is automated to a point where if you fill something out and you all of a sudden your credit rating or something because of a past experience or who knows what, it could be a million different reasons, impacts you to the point now where you may find yourself living out of your car because no one's going to take a chance on you because your score came up this way. So you don't even get to the next level of being considered. And that's so unfortunate because it is such a biased system where there's no wiggle room for explanation. I also appreciated what you said about preconceived notion, because we all have preconceived notions about people in certain circumstances that are completely off and wrong. And so the fact that you had that experience yourself teaches all of us maybe we need to be looking at things differently. Across the board, you know, you always kind of think of the homeless as, you know, definition, skid row. Mm -hmm. um, you know the term that we're all a paycheck away from being homeless? Uh, very true. Mm -hmm. Individuals who were, you know, just becoming practitioners or um, working in school districts who just missed a paycheck of some sort and became homeless. You know, they had the vehicle where they had to kind of just in that program and then get assistance to get back on track. Safe parking has a really unique way of designing personalized plans individuals. It's so important for us to know this resource exists because as you said, all of us are in often in a position where we're one paycheck away. And one of the things that I think is so important about the Small and Gutsy project is that with every organization I interview, I absolutely believe that I could be in that situation yes. because it allows one, and I think Areya said this also, to be empathic with the needs of the population you serve because truly we're all in this together. Yeah. And, and, and just a quick family story of a very, very close family member. We were not living in the same city at the time or I would have offered help. He had to live out of his car for six to eight weeks in between jobs because he had a medical bill of a child that he was responsible for but hadn't known about the bill, wasn't told, that went you know, beyond the time and he had to pay that medical bill and therefore he could not pay rent. Yeah. It was a choice, yeah. right? But you didn't have a choice. It's, it can happen to any of us and uh, it stays with this person even to this day because those kinds of traumas are ever present because as you pointed out, we're only one paycheck away or a circumstance away, a catastrophic illness. So anyway, Sylvia, you start to add. Uh, thank you for sharing that. I mean, I think that we all, we have a wealth of personal connection to, to this mission. And I also just wanna make sure that people know that our clients are people that most of them, this is the first time they've experienced homelessness. Mm -hmm. And because a lot of them have income, whether it's work or benefits, and a lot of our clients don't qualify for the systems that have been developed. They're not sick enough. They're not poor enough. They don't qualify. They don't qualify for rapid rehousing. They're on the cusp, which is really why um, I just want to share, we don't have a day where we have to exit our clients. Mm. Our, our clients can continue to stay in our parking program as long as they need it.
Great. Of course, we do not want to see our clients stay with us for a year, mm -hmm. but they don't have to worry about 30 day marks, 60 day mm -hmm. marks, six mm -hmm. months. You know, when you go into the homeless uh, services shelter system, you have deadlines on how long you can stay there. Mm -hmm. You have deadlines. You have all these rules. Uh, you have to be in at a certain time. You have to, you know, you have to share your space. So there's a lot of reasons why people choose to live in their vehicles as opposed to going into the shelter system mm -hmm. that can create more crisis and more trauma. And they really just need to park safely, have a connection and save money. Mm -hmm. And that's what our clients do. They save money mm -hmm. and they're able to pivot into renting a room or getting into a studio. <laughs> Sydney, Sydney, <laughs> I was gonna I was say Sydney has done a great job with uh connecting with resources. He's created relationships with property owners that have taken our clients in just based on his referral, based on his relationship with that property owner. As well as auto mechanic shops who kind of see the need right now for homeless individuals who are living out of the vehicle. They're willing yeah. to do discount prices for working with our auto repair. Right. Assisting with program plans to get them their vehicles back on track and or selling them a vehicle at a very cheap rate when they know that they still yeah. need to do that. Yeah. You really are an, a prime intervention for this transitional point, both on the side of the resources within um, homelessness services or within the service arena, but also, as you just pointed out, within the resource arena of housing, vehicle support. I really appreciated Sylvia's perspective and sharing with us that the majority of people you serve actually don't fit that tier where they're permanently homeless. And I think that's a really important distinction of the concept of transition and intervention and support that you're providing. Will you all walk us through somebody coming into the, how do they come into the program? You know, I understand that you have an application online, but it can be in person. And then what happens and what can they expect? So people can call us to do an intake. They can start the application process online. And then, you know, their first touch point is with our intake coordinator. And that's really the person that explains the program outlines what it is and will start doing the assessment. Uh, we want to make sure that people have valid driver's license, uh, valid car insurance, and valid registration. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, sometimes people don't have that. Right. And, and we will permit them even though they don't have it because we have resources to help them get a updated driver's license and updated registration and an update and we can help pay for car insurance as well. So though we want to, you know, assess for those things, we provide bridge to support getting those things if that's appropriate and that's what's needed. And the intake process, if you have all your documents and you you know, can either, you know, text us or email us or make an appointment in our office. It can happen the same day Well, you'll, you'll wow. be given a permit to go into the lot. And part of the assessment process is figuring out what's the best area for you. Mm -hmm. Where do you feel safe? Are you working? Where are you working? Mm -hmm. You know, do you have kids that are in school? So we really, you know, try to enroll people where it makes sense for them. Mm -hmm. so that they're, you know, continuing to have contact with whatever resources they had when they started. When a participant parks in our program, they'll get contacted either the next day or no more than two days by their case manager mm -hmm. that's been assigned to them. And then that's where we go over our program again, start to do an assessment, um, make sure they understand what our grievance process is. And then we, we start to build that relationship. The case managers will meet with clients, whether it's virtually on the phone or in the lot, at least um, twice a month. More if that's needed, depending on the case or less, um, you know, depends on the situation. You yeah. mentioned um, kids in school. Can you share a little bit about uh, families? Because we think oftentimes it's an individual in a car, but it's oftentimes an individual or it can be a whole family. 
we have a family at the convention center and they have a one-year-old child uh, in their vehicle. And, and I became aware of the family yesterday because their, their car broke down. Um, we are helping them fix their car uh, because they need their car. And we're helping, we're helping them stay at a hotel until their car gets fixed so that they can then go into the parking program again. At the same time, though, we are connecting to, in the homeless systems arena, there's something called the Family Solution Center. Mm -hmm. The Family Solution Center is supposed to be the catch-all for families, but it doesn't always catch all families. Right. And a lot of times it depends on what funding they may or may not have what crisis beds they may or may not have. And so Aurea made the referral to this Family Solution Center for this family mm -hmm. a week ago, and they haven't been able to secure a bed. Wow. Uh, so that's why they're continuing to park in our program. Mm -hmm. With families, we try really hard to connect them to Family Solution Centers mm -hmm. so that they're not outside. Yeah. Uh, with kids, but yeah. but sometimes they do spend some time with us until they get that connection. Sydney worked with somebody uh, recently who, and I guess this story sticks with me because, you know, was he 70 years old, uh, yes. the gentleman that you helped? Wow. You know, do we think about people staying at safe parking that are 70 years old? I mean, I, I don't think, you know, that's what comes to mind, but Sydney helped this gentleman get into housing. Wow, that must feel good. I didn't oh, yeah. ask. I didn't ask about this, but what are your moments of joy? Placement. They let me succeed um, at their personalized, uh, and I keep saying personalized because you know we have to take the time out to listen to their journey and try to assist them according to what their needs are. You may feel that oh, I want you doing X, Y, and Z, going to college and living this certain type of way. And this particular individual, is seventy years old. And he wanted to live either in an own single shared dwelling and or his own residence with minimum income. Um, so we have to be extremely unique, requiring resources to do uh, subsidy, you know, payments for uh, paying for that housing and resource out to individuals who um, had either bedrooms or dwellings available. And we're just looking to kind of find that connection for them. What a beautiful story. Another outcome of that uh, placement was that with an individual who owned a lot of pieces of properties who truly did not know what to do with her properties, the placement with the gentleman that we placed with her made her feel so good that she now wanted to provide other properties that she had. Like a double win. You know, no, hit it. You know, I started this work as a case manager uh, a long time ago, and I have had every position imaginable in, in our system of positions. And I remember when I stopped being a case manager, I wasn't sure if that's what I wanted to do because I wanted to be a social worker since I was a little girl and I wanted to help people, right? That's what my dream was. Mm -hmm. So when I stopped being a case manager, I really had to like think about that. Do I, is that, how will I touch clients, you know? And I was fortunate to have a good mentor that kind of sat me down and said, you have a lot of skill and you can train or coach people to help even more people that you could possibly ever help as one person. Yeah. And so I think for me, what brings me joy is just watching staff, watching how great the team is mm -hmm. and, and moments like the other day I had the 
the fortune of, of hearing Aurea say, my work is serious. And, you know, let me tell you, she was really serious when she was saying it, I you know, know. And, and, and she, she's like, I'm here to work. And she kind of was just like saying, this is serious. Like mm-hmm. we're holding people's lives yes. in our work. And so yeah. when I'm yeah. here, I'm serious. And I just like, I was like, wow, see mm-hmm. like that, you know, being around people and teams that understand like we can make or break somebody's life really and and so we want to be uh making you know opportunities and and not you know not breaking them and so yeah so that that's what brings me joy is just watching the team and watching them work together collaborate and come up with innovative you know things that we can do or we can try it's really an impact on creating change in people's lives that you're able to do because yeah. you see that impact and you see that change. And you also mentioned the concept of mentorship. And I think being mentored, but also mentoring, which I think all of you actually, you do as an executive director and mm-hmm. it's part of your culture of nothing is insurmountable. So I'm keeping, mm-hmm. like I learn from every nonprofit whom I interview, it's amazing. And then the culture of creating a, a team that is joyful around the change and interventions that they can do on the ground. And it gets me to one other question, because I certainly heard the story of the family member I spoke of before is part of why he didn't share this until years later is because of shame. So I have to ask you, how do you help your clients overcome, like the one Area you spoke of before, who's making a lot of money per month, relatively speaking, but is absolutely shamed because of a credit score. One specific client came to mind. This client had not shared with anyone that he was on house and he was living in his vehicle. And so I said, what about asking family or friends or anything? He said, no, absolutely not. And during our whole, like the report that we built, for me, what is in regards to shame and him not sharing about the slogan the situation was because he had not yet accepted the situation. He hadn't come to terms. And once again, that was also a client. This was his first time living this vehicle. And every single time we spoke on the phone or we met on the law or for any moment, every single time he would say, I don't believe it. He's like, I don't believe I'm here. I, like every single time. I, I can only imagine are you going to process that, having to disclose that and be so vulnerable? So it was a lot of building, right? And respecting his choice of, okay, yeah, we don't have to tell anybody. At the end of the day, right, it was what gives him a peace of mind in an already vulnerable situation. Right. So, yeah, in regards to that, it was breaking around his own pain, around his yeah. own, if we're here, what do we do now? And towards the end, when he was getting closer um, to community housing, he did open up to somebody. What a great turn of events for him and working with you probably got him to that place. And I want to just point out, my guess is your level of respect for him helped him become more vulnerable to others. Because as we said earlier in this podcast, this can happen to anyone. And my guess is in sharing, he was not further shamed. It's, it's the, the art as a case manager to allow them to share their journey without judgment. Sydney, so beautifully said, it really is about connecting with them, respectfully um, understanding their needs first versus and without judgment. I would just add that, you know, uh, one of my core values is, is, you know, education, continuing our own personal Mm -hmm. education, organizational education. I'm a firm believer that I don't know everything. Yeah. And if I'm lucky, I learn something every day. I, I would say that we value um, training and education in our organization. I mean, we do a lot of uh, stuff about, you know, strength-based models, really wow. focusing on people's strengths. Yesterday, uh, we had a training on bias and belonging, mm-hmm. and we evaluated what are our, our own biases and how are our biases affecting our work. Yeah. And and what what are our organizational biases? You know, only in exploring ourselves do we get better. 
And yeah. so I think part of it is that I would like to think that we provide a lot of opportunities for training and, and development. And mm -hmm. in doing that, we are better in our interaction with our clients. A big part of how I lead is due to EML. So make sure to I will give like that, that shout out to yeah. USC's Executive Masters of Leadership program, because I wouldn't be who I am right now without having gone through that program and gotten my master's there. It was an amazing program. I love that, Sylvia. I love um, teaching in that program because it teaches about the application and the experiential mm -hmm. component. And what we know is more of the softer human capital skills. And I love yeah. it. And I love teaching in that program. I love being a part of it. And uh, yeah, I think Carol Giffner is great. And the program is wonderful. Small and Gutsy is sponsored by The Intrinsic Group, my boutique management consulting firm specializing in guiding organizations to leverage talent, optimize processes, and to ensure the organization's narrative is aligned with their culture. We'd love to invite you to be a sponsor. So if you're interested in sponsoring Small and Gutsy to keep it going, please reach out to me at reachus at theintrinsicgroup.com. I want to move into our quick and gutsy questions. So the first question is, what is at the top of your wish list? And the answer cannot be money or funding. I have two answers. One, I feel like the most obvious, and, but not the most realistic. A home for everybody, right? <laughs> the second one, which I feel is doable and can be me. Um, I wish, it, you know, like two on one, where it's like it has all these systems and all these resources. I wish we had a system like that that has all the resources in one, so I can yeah. automatically connect my client to it. For me, one of the biggest struggles is finding the right resource for my client because no client, no two clients are the same. Or maybe it exists, right? I haven't found it, but it has all these resources. And for me, the biggest thing with nonprofits or any organizations that aim to uh, uh, help folks is that we don't connect with each other. Yeah. And we don't say, hey, this is what we have. Like, how can we help you? Um, I wish it was just all one yeah. little tree that has, you know, branches, but that is still one whole tree. Right. One stop resource yeah. hub would be amazing. Sylvia or Sydney? I wish there was more of me and more time and more, more dependable, available housing resources. I wish for us as an organization to have a smooth path to independence. Uh, we are working really hard to be our own nonprofit organization. And so um, my wish is, you know, that we get there this mm -hmm. year. Um, and that's going to really give us a lot of control um, over our finances and, and our future. And I also wish for some, you know, uh, I started in May and there's been a lot of, you know, changes. And, and so sometimes I feel like we make, you know, we, I take, or the organization takes two steps forward as far as like hiring and we have a great team and, oh my God, we're getting close to being fully staffed and then we take three steps back. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I wish that we could, you know, take those steps forward and stay a little planted for, you know, a year would be nice. Uh, <laughs> so that one person isn't having to do three jobs, or, uh, more importantly, me. Um, <laughs> Because I suck at doing three jobs and, and things always fall short. Yeah. Well, my wish for you all is that I think what you're talking about is this, the stabilization of the organization yes. and the potential growth that you have and the independence that you're seeking. So yes. my wish for you is that you get that piece because the other hopefully will come. I also love the idea of a one-stop hub. If you all were to think of a song that describes Safe Parking LA, what would it be? Um, I believe I could fly. Oh, that's such a great one. Yes. want to say Over the Rainbow? We have some karma thing going on because as I said that question, I thought about your organization, how I'd answer, and I thought Over the Rainbow. You know, when you said that, I just thought of the long and windy road. <laughs> I love that one. 
and maybe that's just where I am right now. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think many of us feel that because of COVID-19. Mm-hmm. And I think you also feel that organizationally because it sounds like you're at a cusp of jumping off and into and expanding. And so, yes, you will get to the end of that long and winding road. <laughs> that's great. I love it. What makes Safe Parking LA particularly gutsy? I've worked for so many organizations throughout the years that um, you, know, you get trained on how um, their protocols require you to assess that this client gets this type of service. This parking is so unique. It's true design, personalized, unique plan for the client. And it allows the client to play a major part into that growth and getting hitting that goal. Mm-hmm. And I've worked with several programs. It's just totally unique. It's just, it's, it's great. I, I love that. Policy. I believe that engaging the client in that way reduces shame because it involves them because you're not doing it to you're doing it with you're offering up and you're working collaboratively together and so you have to include the client's opinion thoughts needs anxieties fears whatever it is and that reduces shame because it's without judgment it's really about what's in their best interest and i would say um that we are building the plane and flying it. We do this all together. Yeah. I know that when I've interviewed folks or, you know, I'm talking to folks about coming to Safe Parking LA, I always stress that we are a new organization. Mm -hmm. And this is an opportunity for anybody that's interested in leaving an imprint, in designing, in, in being part of creating that that's that's what we're open to. So we're not set in stone in any way. That's great because it allows you to be innovative, which is gutsy. What is something, and you may have already shared this, but I want to ask it anyway, what is something that maybe that outsiders or maybe even insiders don't know about Safe Parking LA? In regards to like our actual process, um, we do require some documents, right? But once again, no client is the same. Everything is case by case. Yeah. Um, if, when we do the intake, we evaluate if their situation, the documents. Um, if they don't have access to those documents, how can we help? Are we, are, can we be flexible this time? So one of the things that I'm hearing is just reach out and ask, because in most cases, we'll be able to figure out how to work with you. And that's something that maybe, you know, outsiders don't know if they look at your website or feel like they don't fit the criteria or whatever, just find out, just call, ask, we'll help you through the process. If you could get one celebrity or influencer to endorse or talk about Safe Parking LA, who would it be? Oprah. (laughs) <laughs> I, will, I will hashtag Oprah no yeah. all I can think of right now is TikTok <laughs> I have learned valuable information there and as all of you know social media right when one thing is out it, it's out there so maybe not a specific person but if TikTok someone made a TikTok video about us you know Farmers Insurance has been a real supporter of Safe Parking LA mm-hmm. uh, there's that guy who does that commercial for yes. car insurance. What's he's really? He, he's a, a character gym. actor. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thanks him. So. I don't know his name, but I, you we'll, know. we'll have to hashtag farmers insurance, <laughs> and maybe he will do a TikTok. <laughs> who knows? What are the various ways folks can reach out to Safe Parking LA through social media? You mentioned TikTok. We got to get that going. <laughs> what, how early can they reach you? Well, our website. It's always there, uh, and we are prioritizing updating our website. Um, so hopefully that's something we work on in the next three months. Safeparkingla.org, just to be, yes. okay, just want to make sure everybody hears that. I'll post it, but I always like to verbally say it. Yes. So safeparkingla.org, great. Mm-hmm. And what other ways? We're on Facebook. We are on Instagram. People can email any questions to intakes at Safe Parking LA, or they can call our our main number, ask any questions about, you know, the work that we do and, and all of that. And so the main number that you can call or text is 323 
210-3375. And that number um, is, is open during business hours, which are eight to four o'clock. I wanna thank you three for joining me today and sharing really the remarkable work, both intervention and impact that Safe Parking LA has had in the LA area and continues to have, and it seems like we'll definitely have in the future. Thank you. Thank you for having us on. I love Thank you so much. Oh, it was totally my pleasure. It was wonderful to get to know you all. And although you're all new, you seem incredibly seasoned in the space. And I love the culture of the organization about which you spoke so beautifully. Thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Give us some stars and write a review on Apple or wherever you listen to podcasts or buy us a coffee. Buymeacoffee.com backslash small and gutsy. Here's one from Adaptivities, Barbara Gutterman. So honored and proud to have been on your show and included in your journey. Well, Barbara, we absolutely adored having Adaptivities and we'll promote it whenever we can. Thanks so much and best of luck. I want to thank my partners in this endeavor, my co-producer, Sam. And engineer and composer, the amazing Pavel Franson, my exceptionally talented graphic designer, Nate Addy, my social work intern extraordinaire, Stephanie Tran. Please check out their bios on the Intrinsic website and all the folks, friends, and family who have guided and inspired me. Our blog of these small and gutsy nonprofits and social impact organizations can be found in the organizational story section of the Intrinsic Group website so that we can continue to link clients, volunteers, future employees, investors, and donors to this small but mighty network. Of course, we can take responsibility outside of our own vetting of the organizations we interview. So before you sign on to support or work for them, we encourage you to do your own due diligence and research them as well. We just want you to learn about the small and gutsy nonprofit and social impact organizational sector so they can spread their story and their impactful work. From small and gutsy to big with impact, I'm Laura Whitkoff and thanks for listening.